Let's get started with lecture. Okay, so um, I actually decided to um, in some way go back to what we did at the very beginning or the second major topic that we discussed after we had the inference rules and the basics of logic, which is the computation and interpretation of linear logic proofs as session types in the Pi calculus. And I think um, it's useful because A, it reminds you of we did that back then, okay, which will be useful for the final. And also because when you try to do asynchronous session types, which I'll explain in, in a few minutes, um, it turns out some of the stuff that we learned throughout the semester will be very helpful in, in thinking about that. So it kind of ties together a number of the threads that we have been talking about. Um, also, it's something that we actually developed sometime during the middle of the semester. This is kind of a brand new stuff, okay, so should be fun. All right, so let's first remember um, the session type interpretation of linear logic. Let's just do um, linear implication, okay. So let's see. So the right rule looks something like this. If we have delta and we prove A implies B, then we have delta um, Y colon A, we prove B. And now we just have to remember what kind of um, process expression was associated with that. So a certain thing we can do fairly mechanically, right? The right-hand side was annotated with a channel in which, in which we provide a service. Okay, so we don't have to think much about that. And then here we get some kind of a process P. Okay, so now we only have to remember what goes in here. So what's the session type interpretation of A implies B? Yeah? Right. We input x um, along y and then we proceed as p. Okay? So now, so this is the right rule. For the left rule, um, okay, so we have x colon a implies b. And this is on the right, the left hand side of the turnstile. Okay, so just thinking about the logical part first, we break up our context um, into two things. Uh, what do we have to prove here? We have to prove A. Um, and uh, what do we do over here? We have B. And what is it labeled with? still x, because for the same reason that we continue with x here, so we label it with x. So we have some kind of a, a q here, and we have some kind of a r here, and this is going to be z colon c, and there's going to be the same z colon c here. Okay, and so now what goes into the blank spaces here? Um, so what do we put here? Uh, we have to put some new channel, right? Okay. So let me call that small a. Okay. And then what's the process expression here? Obviously, because the left rule has to match this right rule, it has to be an output because this is an input. Okay. So along which channel do we do the output? Okay. We do a new channel a, which we output along x. Um, and then. Yeah, and then we have Q in parallel with R, and this is Q sub A because it depends on this A. Okay, and R depends on, continuous depends on the X. Okay. All right. And then we have a reduction when we do a cut between the two. Okay. Um, and what does the reduction look like? So let's just remind ourselves here. So we have a, an input of a Y uh, followed by P in parallel with an output of an A and then um, some kind of a Q, which is actually the composition of these two things in this example, and that reduces to um, its P, where we substitute A for Y in parallel with Q. 
Okay? So this should all be just a review, right? You could all write that. Okay. Okay, so this is called synchronous communication um, because the output and the input here along the two processes happen at the same time in an atomic way. Okay. So there's no intermediate stage where a message is on its way to be received, but the process P at the same time continues um, as Q continues. Okay. Um, and so the question is, how do we do asynchronous communication, which is more realistic? So it turns out that synchronous communication, where you always assume that a message is sent and received sort of at the same time, is very difficult to implement because on a real machine, you know, you have to send a message and you have to actually implement some protocol to know that the message has been received. So if you want to go down to a slightly lower level of abstraction, you don't, you cannot get this behavior for free, but you actually have to implement it. So what you do instead is you send a message and it's put into some kind of a message queue and on the other end it's taken off the message queue, okay? Um, and so this part, the way we've done it so far, it doesn't actually model that directly, okay? Um, Okay, so the way this is usually modeled is that the output rule, okay, in the pi calculus doesn't look like this, but what happens is that you have an output of an A in parallel with Q, okay? So the output rule doesn't have the output as a prefix to the continuation, but it does the, it puts the message onto the, into the ether, so to speak, in parallel with the rest of the process, and then Q can continue already um, even before the message has been received, okay? And so then the reduction actually, if these two things were in parallel here, then the queue really wouldn't be involved in the reduction, okay? Um, and the message would just proceed like this and the queue would be gone, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So asynchronous communication, you have these outputs which are disembodied, so to speak, if you want there be, be a scope, it would be dot zero, right? When it's received, there's nothing else to be done. So we divorce the message from its continuation, okay? So, but let's, let's keep that there, and let's think about this as a new thing. Okay, so now our goal is to see if we can model this with a Curry-Howard interpretation, because that's the thing that's actually implemented. Well, can we actually do this? Okay. So hmm? Don't we have some problems with that? Like if you had A level, B level, C? Yep. Exactly. So uh, you anticipated my question, okay, and you anticipated the correct answer. So the problem is if you, if here instead of having this as a prefix, if you just put x output a in parallel with q a and r sub x, okay, then if you have in the context x has an a and then a b and then a c, okay, then if you do two outputs to that, the first output will look like, well, create a new a, output A along X, oops, um, in parallel with, okay, um, Q sub A, in parallel with new B, um, output B along X, um, in parallel with Q sub B, in parallel with sum R, which presumably will still use X. You see, if you do two outputs to this process, then the process will look, to, to, along this channel, this is what the process will look like, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So now, because all of these are sort of at the top level, and they're not nested under, I mean, the, the quantifier here, the, these new things can flow to the outside, so they prevent anything from happening here. And so then all these things are in parallel, in particular the two messages are in parallel, and the Q sub A and the Q sub B and the R sub X are in parallel, which means that um, by circumstance, by happenstance, it might be that B is the first thing that's received along channel X, right? And that would not be type sound because B presumably has type B, okay? And X has type A. So if we allow this, then it's not type safe because we create race conditions, okay, in our process calculus, okay? So we can't do this very naive thing. So if you want to model the asynchronous process calculus, we have to be smarter about it, okay? Is that, is that clear? There's also a funny thing that can happen, um, um, something that uh, Henry noticed, um, which is if you have a type um, X, a process X, which is A, 
tensor B, whoops, A arrow B, okay? So what will this do, okay, if, this, if you're providing a process? Okay, it'll output something along X, okay? So you output along X some new A, okay? And you put that with parallel with the continuation. What does the continuation do? The continuation inputs some Y along X, and then there's some Q which has type B, right? Okay, so what happens here is that the idea is you send, okay, an A, and then you wait for a reply along this channel, and then you continue. But you can see that you can eat up your own message. You send out the message, okay, and instead of for somebody else receiving it and giving you back something, you can actually read your own message, okay? So you're communicating with yourself rather than, you know, whoever you want to send the message to, okay? Um, Okay, so for both of these reasons, because message can be out of order, and also because message can be swallowed up by yourself, um, this kind of process assignment doesn't work in a straightforward way. So you have to try to uh, find a way to um, make things work, and so we need some new idea. Okay. Um, any suggestions how we might go about this? Yeah. So, um, have a <coughs> how about an implicit fixes so that you can have the order of the message? An implicit what kind of list? Fixes. Linked list. For example, uh, after this channel is used, I also create a new channel in order to comment the case. Okay. Okay. So that turns out the kind of thing that we want to do. Okay. Um, so when we look at this rule, um, uh, let's look at yeah, let's look at this particular rule here. So we use the same x here and the same x here. Okay, because we output something, then we continue along the same channel with b. Okay, and it's the fact that the channel x doesn't actually change from here to here; it stays the same, which is the problem that can com that. Uh, creates a confusion between these two possible outputs along channel X because X uses the same. Okay, so let's actually go back. If you were thinking about type assignment for sequent calculus, okay, and um, you weren't thinking about its concurrent interpretation, okay, you would probably have given this X prime, this X a new name, right? No reason why we should be reusing the same thing. We only did this because of the way we thought of the processes, okay? So let's think about this X prime as a new name. Right, which we create. So then some of the idea is that this is an output along x, and the second one is an output along x prime, okay? And then the two would be different, okay? And here the, the, uh, both the a and the x prime has to be, have to be new, that there can be no confusion between the two, okay? Um, so we create a new name x in addition to the name a, which we already create, okay? So let's see what that would look like now, um, hopefully. So we create a new A, we create a new X prime, okay, and now we want to output along X the A, okay. So the problem is now, what do we do with the X prime, okay? And the idea is that we communicate the value that we want to communicate, which in this case happens to be a channel A, but at the same time we also send the continuation, which is going to be a new name. So we also send X prime. So we send not one value, but two, okay. So what we need in order to be able to do this is what's called the polyadic pi calculus, where we can send more than one thing at a time. Okay, so we send the value that we really want to send, which is A, and we also send the continuation X prime. Okay, and then um, we can do that asynchronously, and then we have QA and R. And the R now depends not on X, but the R depends on X prime. Okay, the new name that we introduced. Okay, and the whole thing will still be communicating along Z, okay, to the outside. So that would be our process assignment. Now we need to fix the input rule to match that, okay. So we wrote the input rule with the idea is that you input along X and then you continue to communicate along the same channel X, okay. But now actually there's a new channel X prime here, right. 
And so then the process assignment, what would it be here? What, what would be the process term if you do it like this? Right, so we input, we input the value y, which is a channel that we want, as also the continuation. And then we continue with p. Okay? So we receive the value that we want and also the name of the continuation. Okay. And then in the process reduction, um, what happens is that, okay, so the reduction will be you have an x and you wait for a, um, a y and an x prime to continue with p, and that's in parallel with an output along x um, where you're being sent a channel a um, and uh, a continuation. Uh, yeah, we can play name, naming games here. We can call it, uh, let's see. Yeah, so the convention is to actually call it x prime to, to kind of note the fact that it's a continuation. And then it would reduce to p, okay? And here you'd substitute a for y, and you'd substitute this x prime for this x prime here, so that actually wouldn't change anything. So the value gets communicated, but you also communicate the continuation to over here, which is a bound variable here, and that's a free variable over here, okay? Okay, so of course now we need to make sure that uh, everything still works, okay? that um, you know, we have type preservation and cut reduction, um, simulates computation, and all these kind of things. Okay, so, um, but, uh, so I'm not gonna go through all of this, but there, you can see them in the paper. Okay. Um, but we can do at least one more example to give us more confidence that it would actually work. So let's do the rules for a tensor. Okay. So what would be the t right rule for tensor under this asynchronous interpretation? Okay, so the right rule for tensor. So the way to do these things is you always write down what you already know must be the case, and then you fill in the rest, okay? So we must have an A here. We must have a B here. This is gonna be some X. What's this gonna be that labels B? It's gonna be an X prime, right? Because that's a continuation. And this thing here is gonna be a small A. We have a delta. 1 and delta 2, and delta 1 goes here, and delta 2 goes here, okay. All right, so what else can we fill in? Okay. So let's call this P and this Q, okay? And now the actual output has to happen. Tensor is an output on the right. So what does it do? So, yeah, we create an A, okay? and send a and x prime along x. And then, or in parallel, in parallel with p and q, okay? But we need to also bind x prime, it has to be fresh, so, okay? So it's just the same thing happens in the implication left rule, but it happens on the right here, so. We send again a pair, right, of the channel that we want to output and then our own continuation, okay? And then the left rule for tensor, delta x colon a tensor b, okay? And um, so what are the labels for a and b? Yep, A and X prime, right? Because X prime has to be the continuation. And over here we have some process P. Okay, and so what's this process here? It has to match a thing over there. 
So it has, this is an output, so this has to be an input. We input along x, and what do we input? A and x prime. And then we continue with p. Okay? Um, this makes the tensor rules more symmetric. Like the forward is biased on one side, and the just gets two channels. Right. So it looks more symmetric, but we want to interpret it in a particular way. We want to interpret this as some kind of a queue, right? Some kind of a message queue. So let's look at that specifically. Okay. Um, so now we have solved the type safety problem. Um, so the idea is that if we have something like, uh, um, let's say, an output, A tensor B tensor C tensor D, okay? So what does it actually look like if we do a sequence of outputs all together, okay? So um, if this is X, right? Um, then on X, we output a new A, which is supposed to match this, right? And then some new X prime, okay? In parallel with, what's the next thing? What is the output here? On X prime, right? On the continuation, we output a new B um, and an X double prime. And then the next thing will be will be an output along x double prime of a C, which matches the capital C, and some x3. Okay. And let's say we stop there. This is going to be x3. And this first one is going to be x's for the whole thing. Okay. So x3 is now our continuation here. OK, so what this looks like, actually, if you look closely, okay, this is what we did in our, um, when we went from ordered logic to linear logic. So we think of this, we try to think of this as a message queue, and the message queue has in it the channel A, then the channel B, then the channel C. Okay. So it's ordered, so it really works like a queue like we have done in the ordered logic. Okay. So um, in particular, you cannot grab things out of the middle, you have to grab things from the end. And we used this when we gave substructural operational semantics. Okay. So you try to think of it this way, but of course we are not in an ordered logic, and even if you were, there's a problem in the sense that um, when the program executes, there's multiple of these queue active at the same time because you have a complicated network of interacting processes. And for each channel, which has two endpoints, there are multiple messages in flight potentially in the queue. Okay. So rather than trying to fit this into ordered logic, we use this idea that we had an ordered logic that if we have a specification that uses a stack, let's say, and we want to implement in the linear case where things are not ordered, and then we thread through destinations. So our continuations in the linear case always look like this. A continuation, receive a message along D1, do something, and then actually we called it F for frame, do something, and then go to D2. And then there was another continuation which waited for a value on D2, did something else, and went to D3 and so on. Our continuations were like that, right? And it was representing a stack that said, frame F followed by frame F prime. And so we added these additional continuations. So here we're doing the same thing, okay? So we have an X prime, we have an A sort of as a continuation of something to be done. Then X prime is a destination where the next thing happens. X double prime is the next thing and so on, okay? Um, okay, and this is the fact how we actually came up with it when we're working on this kind of, on this problem for the asynchronous case. So we, we, we thought of it as some kind of, um, we should explore it order, some kind of ordered linear logic, but we couldn't quite get that to work um, because of the fact of there were many multiple queues. So then the question is, well, couldn't we just use the same trick we used for ordered logic to map it back to linear logic by introducing destinations? And then when we wrote it down, it became clear that if you could do it, if you had the polyadic pi calculus, where we can pass two things, right? The value that we want to pass and the continuation at the same time. Okay. Um, does that make sense? Rob, you look puzzled. Okay, no, I'm not puzzled. Okay. Do you, do you always just, do you always really use two for the result? Yeah. Actually, replication is a special case, but 
I won't, won't come to that at the end, but essentially that any input or output, well, actually for one, for the unit is still the empty brackets, right? Um, yeah, for the unit you still send nothing because there's no continuation to pass because there is no continuation. Um, but for, um, for the lolly and the tensor, right, you just send the value that you want to send and the continuation and everything works out. Okay. Um, okay, so are we okay with this so far? Okay, so the next question is, well, <coughs> wait a second, what does this mean from the proof theory? Because we already previously had made this connection between proof reduction and computation, concurrent computation in the synchronous pi calculus. If what we did there was correct, okay, then something is different here because actually we don't change the proof rules, right? The proof rules are exactly the same. We change the processes that we assign to the proof rules, but the rules themselves are the same. So something, it cannot be the case that our operation interpretation is exactly the same as it was before, okay, just by single steps of cut reduction, because if it were, then it would be synchronous communication. And obviously now it turns out to be asynchronous, okay. So there must be something in our setup that has changed when we changed our process assignment from the synchronous one where we send one thing to the asynchronous one, okay where we send more than one thing, okay. So the question is, what is that, okay? Um, does anybody have a guess? Okay, so um, hopefully I can erase these without too much trouble. Okay, so let's look at a case where you have a delta proof P x colon A, and then over here we have delta one prime, delta two prime x colon A, and let's say we have a tensor right rule there, okay? So this is a cut in order to get us delta, delta one prime, delta two prime. Um, and here we have nu x and then some process expression. And here we have z colon c. Um, actually, okay, I want this to be the tensor right rule, okay? So it's gonna look like uh, the rule, unfortunately, that I erased. So the tensor right rule does an output, right? Um, so we have uh, um, new, um, so if it's B tensor C, we have a new B, um, and we have a new, if this is Z, Z prime, and then here we have Z prime of type C, and we break it up into two pieces, delta one prime goes over here, and we have B, some process, Q, which is a B, and over here we have delta two prime, uh, delta two prime and some process R, uh, which is gonna be communicated on Z prime. And what we have here, where I didn't leave enough room, is an output, um, of two things, so maybe I'll write it here. So along Z, we output a pair consisting of B and Z prime, and we put that in parallel with Q sub B and R, okay. Okay, so that's the situation that we're in in this particular case. We have a cut, and over here we have a tensor right roll. And the tensor right roll is not on the formula that we're cutting, it's on some other formula. In this case, it turns out, well, the one on the right-hand side. Okay. So now what we can do is we can actually move this cut up, and actually we have to see where x colon a goes. There's two possibilities. x colon a could be here or it could be here. So let's assume it's here. Okay. 
Um, so then we can actually take the cut that we have here and move it up and cut with this premise over here. Okay. Um, and so on the process term, what happens is that the process term before was mu x, okay, p in parallel with this process term, mu b, mu z prime, um, output along z, b and z prime in parallel with q sub b, in parallel with r, okay. Now, if you move the cut up, what would you get as a process term? Can we do this on the fly? There would be a QB. What's on the outside? If the last thing is the tensor right rule, because we move the cut up above into here, right? Then the last thing is the tensor right rule. So we should have new B at the beginning, right? And then new Z prime, right? That what's here. And then we have the output from the tensor right rule. Okay, in parallel with, and now the two processes. The first process is the same as before, it's Q sub B, okay? And the second process should be the cut of this one with the right premise there. So the second cut should be new X and then P in parallel with R, okay? Okay, and you see that these two processes now are related just by a structural conversion. All that we did is we move things around, okay? Like um, we take the new B out, the new Z prime out, and we push the P in, and we can do all these things. We couldn't do them before, we can do them now. It's because this is not a prefix of a process, it's put in parallel with another process, okay? Um, okay, so, um, since we do typing modulo, these kind of, um, structural equivalences, basically, you cannot actually, when you look at the proof term, see which rule was applied first, okay? So in other words, we actually have taken some commuting conversion and made them part of the, the, the computation strategy in some sense, okay? Um, and this makes sense because the fact that you're doing, doing an asynchronous output up here means that, uh, for example, R could communicate with P not waiting for this output to actually happen. That's the nature of asynchronicity, right? When you do an asynchronous output, you can immediately continue. You don't have to wait for it to be received. Immediately continue means that you can communicate with your counterpart in the session type discipline because this R is the one that depends on X, just like P depends on X, okay? So you can communicate P even if this message has not yet been received, okay? And that turns out to be a communion conversion. So what happened is before, when we were doing synchronous communication, uh, under the curry hart isomorphism, we needed no commuting conversions at all, okay? The only thing we needed is the essential reductions of cuts against each other. The only thing we were commuted with cuts with, e with each other, okay? Because, we, because the cuts with each other was basically a new of X and then a bunch of things in parallel, okay? Each of them, you know, between with a private channel. When we do asynchronous communication, we loosen up, we get more parallelism. And the way we loosen it up is by, when we have a cut and we have um, things that do asynchronous output, we're allowed to commute the, the, the cut with this asynchronous output and do more, com more computation that's not blocked on certain prefixes, okay? Um, and so um, in the paper, we actually, um, Henry actually worked out exactly what kind of commuting conversions you get. And each of them just arises from a, a, a particular kind of asynchronous output that didn't exist before. Because when everything is synchronous, the fact that this is a prefix means that you cannot really permute anything inside. So this Q of A is blocked, the R is blocked until this message has been received. In this assignment here, Q and R can communicate immediately. Okay. So from the proof theoretic point of view, the difference between synchronous and asynchronous communication is the presence of commuting conversions. Okay, so commuting conversions are very important to understand when you look at the sort of operational behavior of the secret calculus, okay? We didn't need them so far when we're just doing synchronous communication, but that's just a very special case. Um, okay, questions on this? I actually snuck one of these things in before. 
um, in the last lecture. Okay. So, um, and that was when I said, when the one left rule, okay, so the one left rule was this. We have delta, we have x colon 1. We just go to delta. And this was a process q, z colon c. And so we said, okay, we can do this input asynchronously and put it in parallel with q, right? And the reason I did that is because I wanted to model the mixed rule, if you remember, right? I wanted to, um, I wanted to be able to take two independent processes which don't offer a service and put them together in parallel, okay? And so if x input dot q is a prefix, then you have to wait for x to terminate. If you do two things in parallel, one or the other has to terminate first, and you have to make that decision statically. By doing it like this, okay, I'm opening up the possibility to q continue to work. Okay. But now you see this input here that waits for x to terminate is free-floating, and q can immediately um, communicate along z or uh, z. Yeah, x doesn't occur in it, without waiting for x to finish. And what that means that you cannot actually tell if you look at the output process exactly where this one left rule was applied. Okay. Because it's put in parallel with other processes, there's any number of places in your derivation where it could be. Okay. And that means that you can commute a cut with the one left rule okay, without there being any explicit computational steps. Okay. Um, this is the only case where you commute it with an input because you don't actually input anything. In all the other cases, it has to do with asynchronous output. Okay, and here is just a matter of input. Okay. Um, okay, so we already kind of introduced that sort of under the hood when we talked about how to how to think about mix. But here now it's become sort of uh, um, important. Okay. Questions on this? Okay. So a lot of you did this exercise on the commuting conversions. And so now you see why this kind of stuff is important because it, it's really part of the structure and um, of the sequent calculus terms. Understanding them is understanding which proofs are equal. And in this kind of setting, if you do asynchronous communications, there's proofs that are equal um, that differ only by these commuting conversions. Not everything. You can commute past an input. Input stays sort of impenetrable, okay? Um, but you can go past outputs. Okay, so let's see. Uh, okay, so I want to talk about the message queues. Um, okay. But um, okay, so if you want to make the queues explicit in the language, um, then one convenient way to do it is to have the processes P um, just being the, from the monadic pi calculus, not the polyadic one. Um, and then you introduce a new construct, so that all the things that you already have, okay, and the way um, we do that is we have a sequence of messages M, which I'm just underlined here, okay, which are in the queues going from X to X prime. Okay. So, um, and the reason we're doing this is because we have some intuition that these things really represent message queues. But then you really want to implement them as queues. You don't want to actually change channels on the communication every time you send something back and forth. You really want to have a queue implement the messages, um, the, this idea of, of having a queue. Okay, so if you want to make this explicit, one way to do it is by having a, a pi calculus that has um, message queues in it. Okay, so for example, the, the reduction rules now change because you don't explicitly communicate with a counterpart with an input and output. But if you do an output, you put it in the queue. If you do an input, you do it from the queue. Okay, so if you do an output um, of a y along x, okay, and so that's asynchronous, but we don't actually have to worry about that. We can put it. Um, we can put the continuation there if we want, okay? And we have a queue with some messages already in it that goes from x to x prime, okay? So what would be the result of the transition? Is that y to 
Right. So the prefix goes away. We get P in parallel with X, and you'd add Y to M. Okay. And you add it at the end of the queue, not at the beginnings, if there are some messages already in it. Okay. And then we need the counterpart. It says if we have an X and we have a, a sequence of messages, and the first one is a Y, it goes to X prime. And we have in parallel an input along x prime of some z, followed by q. Then what does that reduce to? Yeah, you just remove y from the q. So the q is now m on it. And it still goes to x prime. And that's in parallel with um, q, except that you replace z by y. You substitute y for z. Okay. Why do you have to use two different names for the two arms? Um, you mean the x and x prime? Um, well, it's a q that represents, implements a channel between, sort of, um, that goes from an x to, from, from one of these, um, you know, from one of these z's to the other one. So I'm not sure how to do this with just one x. Um, yeah, it seemed important to be able to name the ends of the, of the, of the, the q, the two endpoints of the q. Um, we can see um, in a little bit when we look at some of the rules. Um, oh, yeah. So there are some additional rules that we have to we have to introduce. Um, so, for example, if you want to finish communication and you have a queue um, and you have go to x prime, then what you have to do is you have to add some new token to the queue which says complete the communication. Um, the zero goes away. The m bar is still there. And you're still commuting to x prime. OK. So uh, right. Um, so we have this new token, finish, okay, which says that now this, channel, this side of the channel is done. Okay. And we still have to read off, all, we have to drain the queue from the other end to read all the messages that are in transit, right? And at the end, when we're expecting, when we have a message, a queue which is empty, x wants to send only the finished message in it, and we go to x prime, um, then, uh, and we have an x prime waiting for that, then we would just go to q. OK, so the queue goes away at this stage. Um, when the queue is empty and it just says our protocol is finished. OK, now the other thing we have to send on the messages. So the messages M are either channels or something says communication is finished. We also have to send an in left or an in right. OK, and that's because when we have a plus, we have to, on the other end, there's a case waiting. Okay, and we have to say which branch to select. And previously, that just happens by communication. And here we have to enqueue in a, a selection, an in left or in right selection onto the queue. And then on the other hand, there is a case waiting here, and we take one branch or the other. Okay. Um, okay. The uh, channels on the two sides of the queue have different types, right? Um, Right. They definitely have, they have the same type when you start, when it's empty. But as you evolve, they will have different types. Because um, if this is you like A tensor, B tensor, C, you put things into the queue. And they haven't been received yet. So is that the answer to your question? Yeah. OK. OK. So the question is if you can interpret this back into the polyadic pi calculus, or vice versa, if you can think of how the polyadic pi calculus might be implemented in this form, of a, in, in form of Qs. Okay. And so, um, so we can do that. 
And one convenient way to do that is to think of the accused as some kind of notation or the other way around, whichever way you want to do it. And so uh, we have some rules here um, that are kind of uh, definitions that are implement the relation between the monadic and the polyadic versions of these. So if you have an empty Q and we have a process that's still active on one end, okay, then this should be equal to P where we substitute X prime for X. Okay. Um, so if you think about it, if you're in the polyadic version and you have a process P and it wants to communicate and there is no Q that it can put things into, then you can kind of think of it this way and expand it. And now, if you want to output along X, there's a Q, an empty Q at this point that you can put things into. Okay. Um, so we'd only use this, so to speak, from right to left if, you, if P was something that wanted to output something along X. And then you can translate it into this and create the channel. Okay. Um, and then the key rule, um, oh, so a couple of simple cases. If you, if you actually want to output something, um, okay, uh, that's on this side. If you output Y and then follow with P, that should be the same. In the polyadic version, what should that be? If in the monadic version we have an output. So what we have to implement here is a relationship between um, the, the version of the inference rules in the synchronous case, so to speak, with a version of the rule in the, in the asynchronous case. So instead of just outputting y, we create a new x prime. And um, we output the pair y and x prime. And then we do this in parallel with uh, p. OK. Um, except it's not just p, but yeah, we have to substitute x prime for x, right? Because previously, the continuation here was called x, right? You output y along x, and then you still continue on x. Now you output y along x, but then you have to, the continuation is now is called x prime. So this is the, the, the relationship between the monadic and the polyadic version okay, of, the, of this. And there's a similar thing for the input. Okay, so where we had, if we input a y along x and continue as p, that's the same as input along x, a y, and an x prime. And what's our p here? What's our the continuation here? Yeah, it's the same thing, right? This continuation works on x, and now this one is supposed to be an x prime for x. Okay. Um, okay. And then there's a rule, and I won't write it down, um, that lets you take a, a, a q, essentially. Um, so if you have a q, that consists of two pieces, M and N, okay. Then it doesn't exactly fit in the schema, but there is a way to do that. But essentially you say you can create a new destination, X in the middle, and then you make it into a Q. Let's say this is from X to Z, so we create a new destination Y, and we break it up into from X over the first part into y in parallel, then from y into the second part into z. Okay. So you think of a q um, so that you can incrementally transform it into individual messages until they kind of go away um, by breaking it up into two, two with a new destination y in the middle. Okay. So in the paper, we actually do this a little more systematically, one message at a time, which is better to do. But okay. One can also uh, think of it this way. Okay. So it's important, of course, that the thing in the middle is not confused with anything else, so it needs to be a new thing. Okay. okay, so by doing this, we can establish some kind of a relationship. We can say, we write it in this polyadic version because this directly comes from a Curry-Hart isomorphism. 
but we can implement it as Q by applying this translation, okay? And then over here we have the queues that we can actually run, okay? We were also looking at a way where we could take the queue system and give it directly a current out interpretation, but we weren't really able to come up with something that worked well, well okay? So we, there are several typing systems you can think of, several typing rules, but when we looked at the logical contents of these rules, we could never quite make it work, okay? So at first we thought it might have to do with ordered logic. That doesn't seem to quite work out because there are too many queues around. Then we thought it might have to do with focusing because you have to send multiple things at the same time, but it also didn't quite work out. So in the end, it seemed like the best way, if you want to type this, you expand it into the polyadic version, you type that, okay? Um, and if you don't want to do this translation, then you just pull back that type system, and write it down for the original, uh, for this one here. But as far as we can tell, it doesn't directly come from a curry howard interpretation of any particular logic, okay? Um, or at least none, but we, we could figure out, okay? But if you ignore this difference between um, this presentation and the presentation of this explicit Q, I would say we have succeeded in giving a, um, a curry howard interpretation for linear logic which models asynchronous session types, okay? So we can do both synchronous and asynchronous session types that way. Okay, are there questions on this? Yeah? Um, so actually we extended the type categories with forward, by the yeah. of forward. Right. And I feel it will be more clumsy. Because you need two queues to simulate forward. Um, let's see, I think we left the forwarding messages here in this version. Yeah. So we didn't have to, yeah, but that's true. So if you look at some of the literature on the asynchronous session types, you will often see the, the, these, these cues is implemented as two channels, one in each direction. And here the channel can change direction in the middle because it can at some point become empty and then be re-instantiated going in the other direction. Okay. Um, okay, other questions? Okay, so there's one last thing I wanted to do because in the, in the process of doing this, and we also came up uh, with a, a different way to think about bang, okay? Um, and uh, let's see if I can uh, finish the year with that, <laughs> okay? So let's remind ourselves of the rules for persistence, because this new formulation actually I think is quite a bit nicer than the one we had in the earlier papers. Okay, so let's see how far back your memory reaches. If not, then you should definitely remind yourself by the time of the final, okay? So um, there was a cut bang rule. What does a cut bang rule look like? Anybody remember? Yeah? Okay. And this is going to be some kind of a P. Okay. Right. A appears in the persistent context here. And then there's a delta prime, and there's some kind of a Q. Okay. And then we have a cut bang, and then here in the conclusion we have gamma, which gets duplicated here, like in all of the rules, we have delta prime. Okay, and so what's the process expression for cut bang? Right, we have a persistent input along U, okay. What do we receive? How does, um, in which way does U colon A offer its service? How do you use the service U colon A? You send the channel you want to communicate to the server. Right, you send it the channel that you want to communicate with, an instance of it, right? You send it like an X, and X is going to have type A because it clones a version of the service. You send it X, and then the body of it is P, in parallel with Q, 
and that still has the same interface here. We just have to make sure that u is new, right? Okay? So that's the cut bang rule. What's the second um, structural or judgmental rule that has to do with persistence? Copy. Copy? Okay. So we have gamma u colon a. And we did gamma u colon a, delta x colon a, and, uh, or maybe I should call this y, just to make it different from this x there. And we have a uh, r, okay. Okay, what's our process here? that we have to just remember our intuition for what this does. So how do we, how does that work? Right, we're going to new y and <coughs> send it to u and then we continue with r. Okay, so this y is the one of type A that's expected by u which will then communicate with a, a copy of it, okay? All right, so that's good. So we remember this. Um, anyone want to speculate on the asynchronous version of this? Okay, well, how about this? So I claim this is actually okay in this case. Any reason anybody can explain why? Every time you, see, you receive something, it gives you a fresh copy, right. right? So in other words, multiple things that can be received by you can be received out of order. It's not a problem because every time you receive something, it gives you a fresh process to communicate with. It does the copying operation. So there's no possibility that if things are run out of order, there's any kind of confusion, okay? So you still just send it the new name and then you continue to communicate along that name and if somebody else sends it a new name, or if you send it a name later, it doesn't actually matter in which order they're received, okay? It's okay to receive them out of order because you get a fresh instance of the process P each time, okay? So there can't be any confusion, yeah? You always will, I guess, you always receive the thing that was intended for you. It's not, it's not the issue where, like, you just distinguish the return when it's just the... Right. Yeah, there, there can't be any confusion there, okay? The type of U doesn't change after it's under Right, that's the other part. The U doesn't change state the way that a linear channel does when it receives something. In the asynchronous case, it changes state, okay? But here, U is always the same, right? It's always of type A, okay? So this is good, so we still have the, just a single version of there. Okay, so now um, we need the, the, uh, the bang right and the bang left rule, right, that actually um, do something interesting. So the bang right rule, uh, actually let's do the bang left rule first. Um, the bang left rule is x colon bang a. Okay, gamma u colon a. So we have a linear channel of bang type and it gets and becomes a persistent channel. Okay, so Okay, and this was some kind of a, uh, let's say, Q. Okay, so what was the channel down here? Or what was the process down there? Hmm? Okay. New U.
Okay. Okay. Oh, and then the um, uh, X U um, uh, Q. Oops. Like this? Oh, send. You say you can't do that in parallel. Okay, let's go back to the way we actually did it in lecture, even though I'm going to change that. But the way we did it before, we said, okay, the channel change of status, the way we model that is we just take Q and we rename the channel. Okay? So we, say, we just say X substitutes for U. Okay? Um, Or maybe I wrote it in prefix notation. I think I'd, I wrote some kind of something like this. X for U and Q, okay? And that was kind of unfortunate because we had to introduce yet another extension to the pi calculus, which is channel renaming in order to represent um, this kind of transition from a linear channel to a persistent channel. Um, I'm now thinking I used a different notation for this, but. Okay, x slash, okay, right. And I did it so that there was no confusion whether it's a result of the substitution or whether it's some kind of explicit construct. Okay. Um, okay, so let's actually, before we change that rule, let's back up a step. Okay. And let's see in the pi calculus, our interpretation, what, what things are input and what things are output. Okay. So here's the input. And here's the output. So for example, an input is the error right row. What else is an input? Okay, what's an output? Tensor right, right? Tensor right outputs the first part and then continues with the second. Okay, so then over here, this has to be an, an input. Um, sorry, uh, tensor left has to be an output because we have to send it something because it's what's an input. Um, and here we have tensor left, okay, which has to be an input um, because if that's in the context, we're actually expecting it to output something, so we have to input it. Right. Um, what about with right? Is that an input or an output? Right. So we provide two proofs, one for A, one for B, from the same. And we need to, not, we need to know what our client wants from us. And so we have to input an in left or an in right. Okay. And so what's an output to correspond to that? Right, the two selection rules, right, that take, select the first or the second part, okay, have to be output. Uh, what about plus? Okay, when we do an in left, we have to tell our client we selected the left. So we have a plus right one, and we have plus right two. And we have an input, right, which is the... Um, plus left, okay, because the client has to account for both, okay. So if you want to use that, um, we have to input whatever it tells us. Uh, what about unit? What about one? The one right rule? There's no continuation, so we output the empty brackets saying we finished. And then the one left rule is that input that says that the, the process that we're waiting for terminated. Okay. Okay, any, any pattern here? Hmm? Yeah, it's just the polarity, okay? So the output ones are the ones that are positive, right? On that side, on the right side. And this is the one that's negative on the right. 
And these are the ones that are sort of invertible on the left, and these ones are um, that have to be in focus on the left. Okay. So, based on that, where does bang fit in here? What would be the bang right rule? Right, it should be one of these, right? That should be a bang R. Bang R should be an output. So bang left, where does that fit in? Well, it's a positive, right? So bang left should be here, right? Okay. So um, instead, it's some kind of renaming. So maybe uh, we can find a better way of, of assigning process to that. So bang left should be a, an input, right? So what do we input? There's not much choice. Well, yeah, it has to be along x. That's the only thing in the context. And it has to be u, because that's the only thing in the premise. So we input a u along x, and then continue with q. OK? So let's just see if it works out. So then the right rule, oops, there's no context here, obviously. OK, x colon bang a. And in the premise, OK, um, what do we have in the premise? We have uh, y colon a. OK, so now what happens there? So it has to be, should be an input, right, along x. Oh, wait, input? No, bang right, output. Should be an output along x. So what do we output along x? Yeah, but that would be a problem because what this thing wants to receive is a persistent channel, right? So we can't output y. Okay, so now let's actually macro expand this thing. So this says bang a is true, right? And here we have a is true. What is the intermediate step that you always suppress? A valid, right? I knew that you would get that. Because Rob spent the better time of last year thinking about these things. OK. So bang A is true if A is valid. But as a judgment, it's asynchronous on the right. It's invertible on the right. So we go back to the A true judgment, right? OK. So you see there's actually two steps happening, right? And one of the steps is implicit. Now with the proof term assignment, we'll have to make that explicit. So we have to output a u, OK? And u, remember, is evidence that something is valid, right? Because u labels these things here, and these things are the things that are valid, right? That logically, this means a is valid. So we create a u. We output the u along x, OK? And now the second step happens. We have to go from a valid to a true. What does that mean? OK, an input, OK, of what? OK, let's call this P. Well, there's not much left. Why? OK, okay so it's an input of Y along U, OK. So just like this thing kind of is introduced and disappears, OK, here we do. We create a new u, we send it to x, and then we input u along y, OK? Um, input y along u, and then continue with p. So there's actually two steps, which is why I think we missed this initially, OK, in this part. OK, so we should check whether this makes sense, OK? Um, but from this perspective, you would expect that all of this makes sense, OK? It should be an output and the one left. And why did you say you would expect this to be an input? Oh, because the transition from valid to true is invertible, and therefore has a negative character. Right. So you would expect it to be here, because we're working on the right, so that it should be an input, right? So this is this implicit transition from valid to true. Actually, written the other way around. OK. So we'd expect it to be in this quadrant here, so it should be an input. And indeed, it is an input. Okay. Um, what do we need to check? Well, we should check if these two things meet each other, that everything works out, right? The bang right 
and the bang left. This is the bang left, and this is the bang right rule. Okay, so let's just uh, write this out. So we have a cut, and that would be on x, so we have a new x. The left-hand side should be what's written up e, new u. Stop me if I'm doing it wrong. Is it new u? x bar u dot u input y dot p, which depends on y, in parallel width. And what's the other side? x uh, input u, is that right? dot q, right? That's the cut between the two. OK? And so what does it reduce to? Um, OK, so um, this x here, um, this communication takes place. The new u goes to the outside, new u. Um, and then we have um, this communication takes place. Then we have the input of y piece of y in parallel with q, right? So that's just they're working out what this communication means, right? Because this, this output here is received by this input. And so this u here is substituted for this one here. We gave it the same name. So this just happens to be input u, y along u, and then behave like p in parallel with q. OK? Now, the cut there has to turn into a cut bang, right? Because that's the, the reduction between a cut um, on a bang formula return, turns into a cut bang, right? Which is why this has to be empty. What's the cut bang of the premises? Well, it cuts the y. Um, OK. Right. So we need to make it this bang u in order for this to work out. So this needs to be, uh, where does that come in here? Here. And so that needs to be here. No? no? Where? Here? OK, sorry. Right, we don't have bang. OK, so now another anomaly of this earlier system went away. When we had the renaming, we actually had bang of x. And we were substituting u for that, and it worked out. Here we don't have to do that because we do an explicit input along x, which is the name of the channel. So instead of renaming it and having an x there and then replacing it by u, we'll just have explicitly have that um, bang u in there. Um, Oh, right. So that is for the synchronous case. So we detach this here. So can we detach something here? Um, Well, I think there's nothing else you can do because there's no real continuation for this x. Okay, so making it asynchronous, we wouldn't introduce a new x prime to send because actually when you come to here, the communication along channel x will actually terminate because x becomes a persistent channel and x goes away. Um, so. I claim because we're finishing our communication, we actually don't communicate a continuation. We just output you and nothing else. Okay. Which makes sense, well, because here, what would the continuation do? Well, you, in some sense, is the continuation. Okay, because that's um, the, the channel that from then on we'll actually communicate with, right? There's no linear thing in here that we would continue to communicate with. So yes, we can just make it in the parallel version. This just is in parallel with this, and this is in parallel with that. In the sequential version, this, this is a prefix here, okay? 
And and this is a prefix over here. Hmm? Is it ever actually going to make a difference whether that's in parallel or not? Because if you look at the cut, it seems like bang U is not going to do anything until it receives anyway. And neither is Q. Yeah, in order for the bang U to fire, we would have to have received something over X yeah. anyway. And right. One way or the other, Q is lost. Right. So the only reason to do it this way is then, if we're working the asynchronous pi calculus, we don't ever have to consider it as a prefix. All messages basically float. Right. Yeah. But that fits. The fact that it doesn't matter kind of fits with the idea that that's a fake series of two transitions that kind of disappears if you look at it. Right. Okay. Yeah, if you do it, right. Okay. Makes sense. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is a nicer version because we don't need that extra renaming construct, um, and we just uh, send the you know the fresh channel along x when we use it. Um, like I said, I think we missed it originally because um, we weren't thinking about having two transitions here, which of course I should have done, okay, because I often been thinking about that, but we just missed it. All right. So, um, are there more questions about this? So, one of the things you have to allow in the channels in these message queues now is that you send one of these U's. Okay. And it's always going to be the last thing because when it's received, um, then there is nothing more to come after that. So, the last thing in queue can either be finish the communication because we're at a one or finish the communication because we turn ourselves into a persistent channel. Nothing else happens on X after that. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll um, post a link to that paper because I think everything I talked about today in a little more detail but um, is in that paper. So I don't have to write lecture notes for today. Um, um, and uh, so the final will be next Tuesday. It's in 42 something, but not this room. It's somewhere else on this floor. So. Um, and uh, sort of, it's going to be fairly similar to the midterm in the sense that it's going to be closed, closed notes, closed book, and if there's, uh, you know, anything besides a basic inference rule for linear logic that you need, I'll write it down for you. But I'll try to keep the questions so that the test more your understanding if you can apply it into into a slightly different situation rather than trying to sort of memorize and and remember how things are. And if you're not taking it here, I guess um, I will email it, and then you, you get a three-hour window in which you can take it. Other questions? OK, so then the last thing is just uh, to ask you to uh, fill out the faculty course evaluations if you register for the class. Um, if you're not, I guess you can't. Um, but you can just send me your feedback um, on the course. So. Um, I don't think I'm going to be likely to give the same course again, but you know, occasionally I give these um, sort of graduate courses every other year or so, and whatever feedback I get, I will try to incorporate into the next version of it. Okay, okay thank you.